Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Jim Lakeley. I'm the Vice President of the Heartland Institute. And I want to thank you for attending our webinar today titled Governors, Not Gods, Reining in Redux, a Heartland Institute project for co-equal governance during state health emergencies. Uh, this is the second webinar the Heartland Institute has done on this topic. As we've all seen, uh, rules kind of thrown out the window, the uh, blurring of the lines between what a, an actual law is and what a proper regulation is, and comparing that to what governors are ordering states, uh, cities, and individuals and business owners can do with their own lives, all justified by the pandemic of COVID-19. Um, to present uh, a, an alternative view and a view of what state legislators can do in the face of some unprecedented um, abuses, frankly, of government power, we have um, our Director of Government Relations, Cameron Schulte, who's gonna take us through this presentation. And then I, myself, will be monitoring the Q&A and the chat room for any questions that, that we will have, or that, that any of you will have, I should say. And um, you can leave your questions in either place. Um, you can do it during the, uh, during the webinar and I'll be keeping track of them. And so we should have plenty of time for that at the end of the presentation. And so without further ado, to talk about governors, not gods, reigning in redux, Here's Director of Government Relations at the Heartland Institute, Cameron Schulte. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate it. Um, before we get going um, into the presentation, I just want to give a quick shout to uh, the Government Relations team at Heartland, um, Samantha and Tim and Christina, for their help on this project. Um, they've been invaluable. Tim did yeoman's work on a lot of this research and putting it together. So I wanna, I wanna say thanks for, for all their help. And then Jim and Keeley in our communications department for helping get, get everything put together. Um, as Jim noted, we did a presentation uh, webinar on this issue um, back in the spring when it was becoming clear that governors were starting to run amok. And so as, as we thought about this issue, Heartland wanted to provide a roadmap for state lawmakers um, against the noisy backdrop of the pandemic for how legislators can reassert themselves into their state's response to the public health crisis each state faces, of course, to varying degrees. Um, this roadmap is separate um, of state economies reopening and is separate of the science of shutdowns and separate of mask mandates. Uh, this roadmap is about reining in governors run amok. It is a guide for state legislatures to assert their place as a co-equal branch of government. We looked at all 50 states emergency power statutes. Um, we identified those that were good, those that were bad, some that were downright confusing, and some that could be models for their state, for other states. We identified commonalities among the states, and then we decided that we, we should aggregate these, these ideas and these statutes into what we feel are the wisest and most prudent, uh, uh, the most prudent approaches to asserting legislative oversight. So a little bit about me. I just want to go through this real quick because this isn't something that I'm entirely unfamiliar with. I'm going to give you guys, uh, participants on this, some measure of confidence that th this isn't just something we decided to look at. Uh, my background is uh, just prior to Heartland Institute, I was the former communications director at the Wisconsin Institute for Law and Liberty. And prior to that, I was the former chief of staff um, in the office of the Wisconsin Assembly Majority Leader. And prior to that, I was the former chief of staff um, in the office of the Wisconsin Assembly Speaker Pro Tem. And a little before that even, um, I'm the, I was the, state director for freedom works in wisconsin so i'm a bit of a veteran of kind of the legislative process and the legislate the legislative branch as a whole um, it's 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 something that i've always identified with and so as this issue kind of reared its head the issue of governors running amok reared its head this spring it was, it, it really was something I could identify with and, and wanted to see um, legislatures start to reassert and um, start to 
return into a lawmaking role and not necessarily a passive oversight role. So moving forward with that, how did we get here? Where we are at in 2020, right? The emergency power statutes um, almost entirely in all 50 states um, pr obviously predate the novel coronavirus. And the conflict between governors and legislators has been under the surface and waiting to rear its ugly head for almost 30 years now. Um, citizen legislators about 30 years ago um, largely ceded their oversight role and active engagement of public health emergencies decades ago. It's not right, it's not wrong, it's just what happened. And interestingly enough, as we dove into the state's various emergency power statutes, um, and, and, and as we looked into the history of them, it, it, they are all kind of an outgrowth of how the country was reacting to the HIV and AIDS pandemics from the, or epidemic back in the 80s. Um, and obviously since then, and setting aside natural disaster, there have been few, if any, public health crises in the last 30 years. So many of these statutes simply gather dust. And, and until this spring, folks weren't really sure what was in those statutes and how they would execute. So what's the landscape today? Um, this novel coronavirus is very real, and it does represent a real public health challenge. In March, we knew so much less than we do now, and policymakers and elected officials were rightfully alarmed and wanting to stay ahead of the disease. Obviously, we're all familiar. We don't need to rehash, flatten the curve versus controlling the spread, but back in March, April, and May, flatten the curve was what we were, what the goal was. That was to contain the disease so insofar that we did not stress our public health systems. Yet more than just a public health challenge, it was an economic challenge uh, and we, we are still living with that challenge today. And it's a social challenge. And again, we're still living with that today. So what were the lessons we learned to this point? And again, I go back that we, we didn't really know what state's emergency power statutes actually contained. We just didn't know what was in them because we hadn't looked at them in 30 years. Governors clearly seized this opportunity to claw yet more authority and executive power back or unto themselves as it were. And alarmed, many state legislatures turned to the courts with varying degrees of success, right? Um, a good example was in Wisconsin, where the state legislature, um, led by the GOP and the Senate and the Assembly, um, sued uh, Governor Tony Evers. And um, the state Supreme Court ruled that Governor Evers' extension of his stay-at-home order was unconstitutional. Um, but most importantly, what we learned, uh, lawmaker, lawmakers all across the country were mostly frozen out of the decision-making process, both politically and legally. So that brings us to what can legislators do? What are the options available to legislators at this point? So I'm going to spend the next few minutes kind of talking about what makes a good statute, what makes a bad statute, what makes an ugly statute, and really what some of the gold standard uh, statutes are. Um, like I said, we did a deep dive into all 50 states emergency powers um, statutes to, to kind of decide to discern what were these commonalities. And so really what we found was the, the most effective statutes, in, in our opinion, as we looked at this, was, were the ones that had time certain or expiration dates on emergency powers that the governors would um, 
or to the, the emergency proclamations that the governors would issue. What made a bad statute, and, and it, this is almost clear as day, was the absence of any legislative uh, input whatsoever. And then an ugly statute, we, when we looked at it, some were just ill-defined. Um, how they would work in the real world wasn't clearly set forth and would lend itself to a lot of ambiguity and ultimately would probably have to be litigated. And so then there were the gold standards. And, and I, I kind of walked through those in the document. And I want to point out, take a moment here, in the chat, we've added the link to uh, the document that we put together that's our takeaway document um, for, for everybody on it. And as you look through that document, you'll see up that we divided up the statutes. We separated out the good, the really good, the bad. Um, and so take a moment to look through those and uh, you might have questions. But what we saw and what we wanted to get into was kind of these five choices, these five concepts that state legislators can, can, can implement. Um, and these are kind of broad, broad looks at statutes and they're gonna, and it's largely going to be dependent on what your statutes currently look like. And so getting into those, we'll go into those options. And the first one was for legislators to pass resolutions to immediately nullify an emergency proclamation. Um, this one's pretty clear, um, doesn't really need a lot of explanation. Basically, what legislators can and ought to do in the Heartland Institute's opinion is when an emergency proclamation is issued, if the legislature does not agree with said proclamation, simply convene yourselves to, in, in many states, um, in the number escapes me off the top of my head, many states have a provision already in statutes for legislators, legislatures to pass a resolution to, to uh, stop the proclamation, to nullify the emergency proclamation. The second item, and this was really, I, in our opinion, the, the best thing to have in your statutes was time certains. Uh, resolutions for the legislature to put in, to pass resolutions that would nullify an emergency proclamation after a certain length of time, um, 14 days, 30 days, etc. cetera. Um, now, again, thinking about this though, there, there, there's a hard part here, and I'm gonna get to that part in just a minute, um, and we'll go into more detail about that, is for this though, you need, in, in a lot of cases, statutes to be changed. You need to claw back that authority to the legislature such that a resolution can stop said proclamation, right? Without that, that statute, you can pass all the resolutions you want. Um, they don't mean anything unless the statute allows you to do that. Moving to number three, um, and this was again another item that we thought kind of had a universality to it. Um, passing a resolution that requires the governor to call a special session to approve an emergency proclamation. And then with this little caveat here, if the legislature is out of session. Um, that speaks to, because not all legislatures are full time, not go many, 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 um, the vast majority are not in session for um, all year. And I think of Colorado in 2020, for example, is only in session about four months and they're busy passing budgets, which all states are passing their budgets in the spring, um, whether it's a biennial budget or it's an annual budget, um, their session is in the spring. An option for, another option would be to permit an interim committee or group of legislative leaders to extend or reject emergency proclamations. 
Um, that, that again, in the absence of a committee of the whole or the entire legislative body, uh, this would allow you to um, just appoint, say it's legislative leaders or maybe your budget committee to review whatever proclamation a governor would um, issue. And if I'm going too fast, everybody speak up. If I'm, I'm moving too fast, because I want to come back on and talk on some of this, and I want to make sure that we, we're, we have enough time for an organic conversation as well. And then the fifth one, um, which, and, and this one really gets to what we, we saw happening in states like New York and Michigan and Pennsylvania and California, was impose specific limits to executive authority during an emergency proclamation, specifically restrict the governor from unilaterally closing businesses, closing houses of worship, or shutting down freedom of the press or the right to bear arms. Um, that became particularly pro problematic in, those, in the states I, I just mentioned. But, so this is where, with, with against those guidelines, right, um, I, I want to stress that, that these are meant to plug in to revise and amend existing state statutes, right? And I alluded to this earlier. What these resolutions do, you, they need to be codified in state statute. Um, so with that, what, it, it, it's not enough to just have these resolutions, right? It's where you need to actually pass a law. And that gets tricky, right? Now we're talking about a political question. And um, because nobody wants to go run headlong into a popular governor or against public perception that you're messing with the gears of government in, uh, in a public health, during a public health crisis. Um, so we also wanna be mindful of governors um, using end around such as redefining an emergency or shifting goals for example flattening the curve to slowing the spread or uh, using wisconsin as, as an, another example renewing orders under the authority of a state health agency um, so getting past that recognizing that these that your the very statutes need to be changed um, want to talk about some of the challenges and, and, and opportunities. So moving forward, I, I would be remiss to, and I, I, I specifically want to make this um, front and center, the political pitfalls. I am not, and the Heartland Institute is not insensitive to the political challenges that legislators face in the states, when the narrative inside said state is that Governor X is moving swiftly to contain the spread of coronavirus or whatever the next pandemic may be. So we recognize that there's very real political pitfalls um, involved in this process. Um, and that is something you need to, to, to decide. Is the juice worth the squeeze? And with that, you know, as we think about it, the, 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 the politics of it really are the 800 pound gorilla in the room. Um, when we did our reining in webinar back in the spring, we took a few calls and had a few meetings with legislators from a few states that said, what can we do? I want to do this in my state. And in, in particular, I, I, I can think of one from Minnesota, who uh, this legislator in particular was asking us, what can we do? Is there a legal remedy we can provide? And, and as Tim and I looked at this into the statute and we met with the legislator, it became abundantly clear that the Minnesota statute was at, is actually a fairly good statute as, um, by these standards that we've outlined here. The statute was a really good statute and they, and there wasn't a legal, um, there, there likely wasn't a legal challenge that they could have brought um, that would have clawed back some of that, um, some of that authority and oversight over 
uh, the governor in Minnesota. So they were faced with a very real um, political issue. A uh, good example, again, is Governor DeSantis in Florida. You may or may not agree with what Governor DeSantis is doing, but his poll polling is showing that the actions that he is taking in Florida um, are popular with, the, with uh, the citizens of Florida. So for the legislature to take this opportunity in the middle of pandemic to say, no, we're going to claw that back, that's a, that's a political question. It's not a legal question. Um, and that kind of a, stepping aside from that real quick, and that's kind of why we wanted to take this opportunity right now. Um, almost all legislative sessions are over. What is going on now are various special sessions happening in the states across the country. But as the fall passes and legislative agendas for the upcoming spring legislative sessions are being considered, there might be this take to take this opportunity to take this time to kind of flesh out what will work if indeed those statutes need to be adjusted or modified in some way or another. Um, so we wanted to kind of take this downtime um, from the legislative process for people to kind of collect up their ideas see what's going to work, start counting their votes, and that sort of thing, so that when spring sessions start in January, February, and March, um, there are good fleshed out ideas, and you've been talking to your colleagues about what's doable, what's not doable. So that's the political pitfall that I wanted to talk about uh, for a moment. Moving forward, and this is... A, this, <laughs> This, this is where my background, and this is really what I want to speak to you and appeal to your better angels on, is that, and, and I use Fredo Corleone, I can handle tangs, I'm smart. What I wanted to, 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 to stress here is that the state legislatures are indeed a co-equal branch of the, of, of the government. And it's important that lawmakers who are lawmakers who are elected by 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 the citizens who have direct lines to these citizens is that they are engaged in this process and this speaks exactly to the presentation they are governors they are not gods let the legislature and every legislature should reassert itself in this process um, lest we have Governor Cuomo returning senior citizens to nursing homes, lest we have um, Governor Whitmer in Michigan choosing winners and losers in the business community. These are situations we want to avoid, and this is where the, legislate, the state legislatures really need to assert themselves. And th this is something I cannot stress enough. Don't be afraid of, right? be assert yourself and say we are an equal branch of government and then last night as i was thinking about this and i was prepping for for this uh presentation this webinar today i was i was laying in bed and thinking about the issue and it occurred to me why not create, why can't legislators create a session day every 15, 30, every 45 days um, to review any emergency orders that are currently in effect? And here's, here's what got me thinking about this. Every state's legislative session is varies. It's different. Um, some states are only in for a month. Uh, other states are in nonstop for a year or two. Some states aren't even around uh, for more. Thinking about Texas, the Texas legislature is in for a few months, once every two years, to basically pass a budget and move on. So, in that case, you could take a hybrid of those five concepts we were talking about before. Take those. Take a hybrid so that you can because. Let me back up. 
Pandemics don't care when your session days are scheduled, right? So you can't, you may not be, legislatures may not be in session and may not have those opportunities to, to um, review proclamations by the governors. So here you want to kind of manage your calendar. And, and, and that's kind of what got me thinking last night as I was thinking about this was make it a point as you set your session calendars early in the session um, and each state's different again. But as you set your sessions, session calendars, set them such that there is a built-in mechanism that if there is a pandemic, even if there isn't a pandemic, you can gavel in and gavel out, but you have that mechanism, that release valve that is already on the clocks for you to review whatever is happening. Um, so, uh, or whatever the governor has, has decided, whatever, answer to a pandemic or an emergency might be. Then number four, be the ball, Danny. By this, I mean the legislature is the solution to bad statutes. So whereas 30 years ago, these statutes were all being put into place and they collected dust, here's an opportunity to say, all right, we recognize what they were. Moving forward, the legislature is the solution to bad public policy, to a bad statute. And, and this builds off of, right, this builds off of uh, the point about being a co-equal branch of government. And then lastly, um, lastly, I wanna point out that in all of these cases, and we'll get into it more. Um, but in all these cases, work with your state's legislative council, your uh, whatever that particular bureau might be, work with them to find out where the gaps are in your statute. And certainly that's where Harlan Institute comes in. And that's where kind of this ongoing project that we've been working on is, reach out to us, we're happy to look into your statute and say, this is good, this is bad, this isn't right. And if you look in the document um, that I, I hope you've been following along with, but if you look in that document, I, we separated out those states that we think have strong statutes and then those that are okay, then others that are just not good, and then the others that are kind of very confusing. Um, one that jumped out at me as I, as I was going through it, um, it just turning to a page in my notes, looking at Florida. Florida's statute, the legislature by current, by concurrent resolution may terminate a state of emergency at any time. Seems self-explanatory, seems pretty clear. My concern there would be um, it's limited by political will and there's no release valve by, if there, there's no, time certain in it. Um, another state, as I look through my notes, um, New Hampshire was another state that, that kind of caused us some concern um, in their statutes because theirs lacked a lot of definition. And in, in my opinion, as I looked at it, there's a lot of statutory ambiguity in, in, uh, in their state emergency powers. And in, in that case, when you are trying to respond to a public health epidemic or a public health challenge, ambiguity in your statutes, there, you, you don't have the time for these things to bog down in courts. So here's, in, in this again, bringing, coming full circle, is now is the time to be looking at your statutes so that you're ready to hit the ground running um, in the spring and free of a burden of election and free of, of of um, that competition for, for attention on all the other issues. So you can actually take this downtime to look and get it right. Um, with that, I'll actually kind of wrap up. That took me about 30 minutes. And so thank you, I appreciate it. And if anybody has um, questions that I might be able to answer, and if I can't answer, I'll try. Um, do the new guy two-step or something and try to make it interesting. 
otherwise we'll certainly dive into um, statutes with you and try to get you a good answer moving forward. Okay, uh, thanks Cameron. We actually have um, a couple of questions or I should say a, a, a comment from, um, and I would actually encourage everyone uh, to get into the chat. Um, we can actually uh, maybe even have someone joining the joining this presentation uh, with, via their voice. If you can either, I think there's a raise your hand option um, or, or you can also just tell me in the chat that you would like to you know, speak directly and uh, join it um, via voice instead of me reading your questions. So just let me know, we can try to, we can try to pull that off. But um, Kim Koppelman uh, writes, uh, Cameron, thank you uh, for this important focus. And that item three is more, in, more critical than you may realize. And going back into your presentation, number three was uh, pass a resolution that requires the governor to call a special session to approve of an emergency proclamation if the legislature is out of session. And uh, Kim says, North Dakota is one of only four states in the nation which has not met in either regular or special session since the pandemic began, which is remarkable. Absent such a provision, the legislative branch of government not only loses all relevance, but essentially ceases to exist during a declared emergency such as we've experienced this year. I wonder if you might want to address uh, that comment, Cameron? Well, first off, I'm just, I just, I'm so glad that uh, Representative Koppelman uh, joined us today. Uh, I just, I, I've always enjoyed having conversations with him and he's, he's a very insightful legislator. So I'm thankful that he, that he jumped in today. Thinking about North Dakota, I, I think in, in I, I'd have, I'd want to spend a few more minutes thinking about this, but my initial reaction is when North Dakota's legislature sets, sets its session calendar, the answer here may be to build in those days um, that, I, that I mentioned, where every at once a month or, or once every six weeks, say, we're going, this day is specific for dealing with public health emergencies moving forward. If there is no public health emergency, you just have your speaker pro tem gavel the session, the session day open and you have them gavel it closed uh, or what, whatever specific process you have for something like that. Um, but similarly, I think um, also with that, a good answer is to um, have an interim committee or a group of legislative leaders that would meet regularly in the absence of bringing the entire North Dakota legislature together to review a proclamation, you could codify in statute one house, both houses could meet to review, but in, the, in considering North Dakota's situation, you may just say that legislative leadership two in the House, two in the Senate, will meet to discuss proclamation and can be and can nullify whatever emergency order uh, the governor would issue. Good, thank you, Cameron. Uh, Vicki Kraft has a question. Uh, has Cameron looked at Washington state laws, RE emergency proclamations? Washington hasn't come back for special or regular session either since we adjourned prior to COVID-19 emergency proclamations. Uh, and she is, uh, she represents uh, the 17th legislative district. Well, I, I'm actually glad you asked about Washington. I, I, is, I was going through these and as Tim looked at these as well, we looked at Washington and said, you know, that's a pretty good statute um, as, as, as far as it goes. And I'll just read it real quick. It won't take but a moment. No order or orders concerning waiver or suspension of statutory obligations or limitations during a declared emergency may continue for longer than 30 days unless extended by the legislature through concurrent resolution. And I'll just kind of stop there real quick. And if you recall, those time certain um, clauses inside the statute, we think are critical to containing gubernatorial powers. Um, now, the problem in many states is, and I alluded to this, is that, right? If your governor is popular, then the issue then becomes, do we want to expand political capital? 
that's not for me to answer. That's, that's for the boots on the ground. That's for the legislators in, in Washington state to decide. Um, if the legislature is not in session, the waiver or suspension of statutory obligations or limitations may be extended in writing by the leadership of the Senate and the House of Representatives until the legislature can extend the waiver or the House of Representatives. Again, there's another example where it seems like Washington set up this hybrid model of those uh, picked and choose, or they picked, they, cho they cho choose, chose what, what um, of, those, uh, of those solutions that we prescribed uh, a little while ago, they, they, they decided to go with a hybrid model. So I, I actually hold Washington up as a good statute. And um, the challenge obviously then is a political one. And I, I think from what I see in Washington, a compelling case can be made for reining in the governor or even tightening up that, that uh, statute, maybe bringing 30 days down to 15. Well, I'm um, Vicki Kraft. Uh, she's there. She's muted. She uh, raised her hand. So we're going to attempt to have her uh, add to her written question. Go ahead, Vicki. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Great. Thank you. And thank you, Cameron, for the, the presentation and the comments. Um, I guess one of the challenges that we are facing, although our laws are written well, um, the governor is carving out certain aspects of these, I'll say, shutdown orders uh, to effectively, he's interpreting them in such a way that certain aspects of the shutdowns are not accountable to the four corner or four chamber legislative leadership that normally, to your point, would give oversight. So for example, he is saying that um, he does not need to um, uh, basically, he, that he can uh, stop or prevent certain actions on his own as an executive outside of that four corner legislative leadership or the 30 days. He is prohibiting certain actions. That's how it actually uh, mm -hmm. reads in the law, that the governor can prohibit certain actions basically on his own as the executive and it falls in his interpretation outside of those guidelines and the law, the law, 30 days and leadership oversight. Mm -hmm. And so things like shutting down the businesses for an extended time, all these things we're still seeing as heavy shutdowns. He is saying he's just prohibiting certain actions. So he's skirting around our laws. How do you address that in particular and rein that in? Yeah, that's actually a really good point. And you know, we thought about that and that I, I kind of spoke to, to that, to that point, be mindful of governors using end arounds, such as redefining an emergency or shifting goals or renewing orders under the authority of a state health agency. Um, I, I, in, in, without trying to possibly perceive or conceive of every, every scenario that a governor might try to, um, find loopholes in the state statute. I think you, in that case, you go to this, say, we're going to actually impose specific limits to executive authority that he cannot um, shut down the house of worship or whatever that case may be. And again, it, it's a, a, a crafty politician, I suppose, will always try to find loopholes to pull more um, authority unto themselves. So I, I, my, my suggestion there is tightening up your statute to the, to the extent he's kind of tipped his hand the, or the governor in Washington has tipped their hand, you now know what their line of thinking is and you may be able to fend that off in the future. Yeah, thanks. We need to probably pick up a few extra seats too to, to do some of that. Right. <laughs> Thank you. But, but Mickey, if you want to um, follow up with an email, please follow up with an email and we can do a little deeper dive and have a longer conversation about what's going on in Washington, if you like. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Um, I've actually hit allow to talk to Rich Collins, who has a question. I'll see if, um, if he wants to ask it himself. I can read it. If you're talking, Rich, you're muted. There you go. Uh, no, I'd be happy to. Um, 
Uh, our state is so blue, the state of Delaware, uh, that they are not going to do anything to limit the governor. In fact, our Speaker of the House stated about a month afterwards, after we started, uh, this is the best way because the government can act a lot more quickly than we can. Um, I have been attempting to organize a lawsuit of, without a lot of success in terms of funding. Given that this governor is enacting, frankly, his emergency actions are having far more impact on citizens than the laws we pass in a general sense, uh, why are not the courts willing to take action as a result of a suit to uh, restore the balance of power? Well, uh, thank you for the, for the question, um, Rich. So I pulled out my trusty sheets and I'm looking at Delaware. And right next to my sheet, I've got a B telling me Delaware statute, not good. No relevant provisions found. Statute addressing emergency executive authority is located at Del Code Annotated Title 20, Chapter 31. Now, I, I'm going to disagree. I think we're the ugly. <laughs> I do have it, and it specifically says it's up to the government to have an emergency any time for as long as he wants to, all by himself. Yeah. Uh, I was trying to get it, and I couldn't get my phone to operate fastly enough. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's under civil. It is under Title 20. Yeah. And so, my, <laughs> I know this is no consolation, right? Because as a legislator, you're trying to do right by your constituents and and in, in trying to find that center right balance to a center left governor. So, so you're in a bit of a predicament, I understand. The good news is in the absence of a statute, you get to craft a brand new one. You don't have to worry about changing anything. You get to say, we're going to lay on top of our statutes and we're going to place upon this governor who has done X, Y, and Z and has caused A, B, and C to occur, and these things are detrimental, this is why we need a statute. And you actually have a blank canvas in Delaware. Now, I know that's not good news per se, but at least it's you have this opportunity to make a fresh new case. Um, now, to your specific question about why, why the courts aren't touching it, I, I, I couldn't begin to answer that question. And, uh, but I, I suppose with a, a little more time, um, we could think about and we could look into some of the rationale, some of the things that have been said publicly um, by legislators, by the governor, and perhaps even find a court case that, that suggests. So if you want, follow up with me offline and uh, we can do a little deeper dive in Delaware as well. Well, I'm going to be uh, trying to work with you. I absolutely intend to introduce a package of laws when we go back in in January. Um, I'm yeah. hoping that as time passes and we get a little farther away from the immediate crisis, the courts will be more willing to look uh, without looking like they're stepping into the middle of a crisis. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thanks, Rich. Okay, uh, next is um, uh, Kim Koppelman. Let me hit the button. Kim, if you unmute yourself, there you go. Rich oh. Koppelman, thanks for hanging out with us today. You're welcome, and thank you for the kind words uh, as well, Cameron. I, you know, I, I want to not only compliment you on uh, focusing on this important issue, and it occurred has occurred to me, and I'm sure many other legislators, that two very important issues uh, that I think are in, in the forefront of most legislators' minds across the country this year are federalism, and I know that's not what this uh, topic deals with, but also separation of powers, which clearly is the, at the center of what we're talking about here. And um, you, you're also touching on the nuances involved. You mentioned the political considerations, and that's an important point because as you pointed out, most governors I think are heroes in the polls and in most of the public's mind, and most of the public probably hasn't even thought about this these inside baseball kinds of discussions as to, you know, gee, is our governor cutting the legislature out? And, uh, and if so, 
what does that mean to us? You know, they are our elected representatives, et cetera. Most, most members of the general public, I don't think, are thinking uh, that far ahead of the curve. And of course, those of us as legislators do. Uh, the other nuance, and I think Rich brought it up in his recent comments, and that is the question of, uh, you know, the, the most logical avenue, uh, absent statutory revision, which you're recommending and which I completely agree with, is, uh, is lawsuits and, and, you know, getting the courts involved in the restoration of that, uh, that balance of power, if you will. And, uh, and there are also uh, logistical or perhaps even political considerations there when it comes to uh, you know, gee, how would our court intervene? Would they want to step in to this water in the midst of a crisis and look like they're tying the governor's hands, uh, allowing him or her to respond appropriately and so on? And, uh, and I guess my question for you, and by the way, before I, before I close the, the question, the comment, I've got to share something that if you haven't seen, I had to chuckle at uh, that I saw online recently, which said, uh, Dear South Dakota, does your governor have a sister? Sincerely, Minnesota. <laughs> I thought that was... <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> at any rate, um, absent the, the lawsuit route, even if a state has good statutes, what is your recommendation for how legislators can respond uh, if a governor uh, or an executive branch uh, simply does its own thing and um, kind of ignores even the laws on the books or, or, or almost rewrites them at will? Um, you know, obviously you can, you can sue over things like that, but... Uh, you know, if for whatever reason uh, you don't want to go there, uh, are there any other uh, other ways of enforcing? Even even if you had a good statute on the books, if the governor chose not to observe it, and you've talked about the workarounds that they attempt, uh, what other avenues, if any, do you think are available to legislators? Yeah, I'm actually. That's a really good question, Representative. Um, I, I can't thank you enough for it. To start, my first reaction is, if you do go to the courts you're either going to win or you're going to lose. And if you lose, you might actually set your cause back further, right? Because sometimes a judge or a Supreme Court justice is going to put language into law that you really don't want there and will become hard to work around. So the best solution is always for lawmakers to make the law and not let the courts and to not let the governor make law, right? So with that having been said, I think in this case, and, and you've seen this, and I, I alluded to it before, in this case, what you want to, I, I think an option you have available is to control the rulemaking process. You know, as a, as a veteran of the legislative branch myself, the rulemaking process is really right where statutes where the rubber meets the road, right? You pass a law, you tell the agencies to write the rules, and then the executive branch kind of applies the law, right? Um, how a bill becomes a law, we, we, we all know the song. So with that, I, I would say your best option is to be a thorn in your governor's side at every step of the way in the rulemaking process. Um, you know, you have a, a federal model um, in the RAINS Act. I know Wisconsin has a state version of the RAINS Act. I think every state should come through with some degree of very explicit oversight of the rulemaking process and the appropriations process. I remember um, back in Wisconsin when I was a much younger, smarter, and energetic man, um, we proposed a, a, a bill called the State Legislative Oversight of Budgeting Act, SLOB. Very clever, weren't we? And the, the point was to once per legislative session, we would haul in every member of the governor's cabinet and say, where's your budget? What's the state of your budget? Are you running a deficit? Are you running, are you running rich? Are you running lean? And so I couldn't be more in favor of oversight in whatever form and as ornery as you guys want to make it. I will, I wholly endorse uh, lawmakers um, making governors and holding governors accountable. Cameron, let me uh, respond briefly. Thank you for that answer. And, uh, you know, it is, it is music to my ears in a way because uh, 
it's, it's kind of an old favorite uh, focus of mine. Uh, 25 years ago, my very first legislative session, I introduced legislation to do exactly that and to give the legislature oversight of the administrative rules process uh, through its administrative rules committee because, you know, uh, we have a nameless, faceless, uh, unaccountable, unelected bureaucrats in essence making law with little or no oversight. And uh, obviously, as you said, it's the legislative branch that is constitutionally empowered to make law. So it's important that uh, if we delegate any of that authority, by golly, we better oversee it and we better restrict it. And so we do do that in North Dakota. And it occurred to me when this process began that the governor has some options in addition to an emergency statute, in addition to an emergency commission, which we have in our state, and in addition to something called the Legislative Management Committee, which can approve things when we're not in session, et cetera, uh, the governor can authorize emergency rules. And unlike uh, the normal rulemaking process with emergency rules, they go into effect right away, uh, prior to public hearings, et cetera, and prior to the legislative oversight. When the legislature does, next, when the uh, Administrative Rules Committee does next meet, then it has uh, that same authority over an emergency rule. However, it's designed specifically for emergency situations, you know, as the name implies. The, the problem, I think, is that most governors, rather than even going that route, though, are simply issuing executive orders with virtually no underpinning authority, perhaps in law, or far exceeding what the law actually says their authority is. So it's a little bit of a catch-22 even beyond that realm. And uh, I've, I've, I've spoken enough, so I'll be quiet. But uh, it is something I think a lot of us as legislators are scratching our heads about. Yeah, just uh, it, it, that's your point is really well taken in that um, governors tend to act, and we've seen them, um, they tend to act under the premise that it's easier to ask for forgiveness than it is for permission, right? And anybody who's had children know that that's how they operate as well. So, you know, so you really have to be mindful of that. You know, in many ways, all these governors, you've got 50 examples to choose from, are, it's like a poker game, right? You're watching them, they're tipping their hand, you're seeing what their proclivities are while you're doing this kabuki dance with them. Um, so in that way, you can next, when you got, when all these legislators return in January, you can say, all right, well, Governor X showed his hand. We're going to have to go dial him back this time in that capacity. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so um, before we get to, uh, to David Rowe here in a minute, uh, Cindy Lamb, she asked, where can I get an example? of the good statute that you refer to? Oh, sure. It's, in, it's actually in the document that's in the chat at that link. Um, that PDF, um, we, sorted, we sorted the statutes and, and, um, and, and uh, footnoted them so you'd be able to find them in your own books. But we also, we sorted them by good, bad, ugly, and otherwise. Um, so in that document, they're right there um, as, as your template. But if you have a specific question, please let us know and we'll direct, we'll help you direct traffic on it. Right, yeah, you can reach Cameron at uh, cscholte at heartland.org and we'll make sure you get all the materials you need. But I did share that document uh, in the chat. You just maybe have to scroll up a little bit to get it. Uh, we're gonna bring in David Rowe. Um, David, could you identify yourself so that everybody on the call uh, knows from, from where you hail? Absolutely. My name is David Rowe. I represent the 85th Legislative District in the Pennsylvania House of Representatives, and I really appreciate uh, you guys having this call. It's incredibly relevant, I feel like, to a lot of us, but especially here in Pennsylvania, where we've been uh, banging our heads against a wall for a couple of months now. Um, the uh, Pennsylvania General Assembly has been active throughout the era of COVID. Uh, we do have uh, split control. We have full Republican control, control of the General Assembly, uh, but a Democratic governor and Supreme Court. Uh, we've been hamstrung uh, by the governor who has been exploiting a poorly drafted and decades old statute. Uh, and he's been backed up by an activist Supreme Court that continually exercises its King's Bench authority uh, to protect the governor from every lawsuit we've tried to bring. Um, we are using the, uh, our current proposal is to issue a, a set of constitutional amendments to limit the length of disaster declarations. 
Uh, but those amendments won't be proposed to the voters until May at the soonest. Um, so that's uh, the long-term plan. Short-term, however, uh, we were uh, taking the route of proposing a declaration of suspension uh, based on Article 1, Section 12 of the PA Constitution, which refers all powers of suspension uh, to the legislature. Our position uh, from a legal standpoint is that a simple majority of the legislature is constitutionally empowered to suspend a statute. Uh, it was just unveiled last week. We haven't reached a simple majority of signatures uh, yet, uh, but we probably will eventually. Uh, my question is, uh, have you seen a declaration of suspension uh, uh, used in the past? Was it effective? Uh, and what sort of legal hurdles might we run into with this? Um, good question. Re real quick for, for everybody, on the webinar, I've, I've got Pennsylvania, we've got Pennsylvania marked as ugly. And <laughs> we do, because it's almost good, but because it's not good, it's really, it's, it's really ugly. And I'll read it real quick. The state of disaster emergency shall continue until the governor finds that the threat or danger has passed or, to the, or the disaster has been dealt with to the extent that emergency conditions no longer exist and terminates the state of disaster emergency by executive order or proclamation. But no state of disaster emergency may continue for longer than 90 days unless renewed by the governor. So the governor gets to do whatever the governor wants for 90 days, and if he doesn't like that it, he can only do it for 90 days, the governor gets to do it for more than 90 days. So basically, really, in Pennsylvania, Governor Wolf is a god. Right. And that's exactly. And, and I love the fact that you guys are looking in Pennsylvania, that you guys are looking at every possible avenue. Um, seems to me that it's a perfectly clear that if you want to do a suspension, a simple majority ought to suffice because it's a simple majority that place that creates law. It should be a simple majority that suspends it. I was wondering if you if you foresaw, I mean, at this point, we have <laughs> seen that the Supreme Court hasn't necessarily needed to have uh, uh, legal justification. Uh, I, I'm not sure if every state has a uh, Supreme Court with King's Bench authority, uh, mm -hmm. but that essentially means that the Supreme Court can elevate any case in the Pennsylvania judiciary to their court. Uh, so our lawsuits that have been brought to more friendly lower courts have immediately been elevated before the friendly courts have had a chance to rule on them. Uh, and the uh, Supreme Court has acted against us time and time again. Uh, I wasn't sure if this was something we should prepare for them to do again so that we could get our, our ducks in a row before we face a legal challenge or if you thought it would just be effective on its own merit. Um, I would anticipate in, in what you see in most most, if not almost every state um, in Pennsylvania, you guys call it a King's Bench. I know in Wisconsin, it's called original action. Any question, basically any question r regarding the very um, structure of government, any question regarding um, a constitutional question, the state Supreme Court will reach down and pull it up to its court uh, to its jurisdiction and it will effectively run it um, as an actual case would otherwise work but it's sitting in the Supreme Court so there will be um, legal there will be briefings there will be hearings there there's the, the, the whole legal process will play out but at that Supreme Court level my advice um, and again talk to smarter people because I'm not that I'm not one of them, but if you happen to have a friendly attorney and they could opine on it, my gut would tell, tell me though that I would assume this is headed straight to the Supreme Court no matter what you do, especially considering we've seen the proclivities of Governor Wolf. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you, David. Okay, well, we've come here uh, with, unless there's another question and I don't see any other uh, hands up. I think um, we'll uh, pretty much wrap it up here for today. I gotta say that um, I really enjoyed this, this webinar, um, hearing the state legislators come, legislators come in and speak uh, for themselves and really add it to the conversation. I know that the Heartland Institute wants to do a lot more of these. We actually have a few more already on tap and Cameron will be in contact with you. 
about what those topics will be, and, and I'll let him wrap up here in a minute. But I also want to encourage all of you to reach out to us and let us know how we can be of better service to you. You know, even after COVID, um, you know, after we go back to normal and COVID isn't part of our lives every day um, in such an intense way as it is now, we want to be able to provide this kind of service to you as a member of our legislative forum. And we encourage you to actually to speak to your colleagues and let them know that Heartland Institute uh, can be a real service to you. And I hope you're getting as much out of this as a legislator as I get out of it as a layman. Uh, with that, Cameron, if you want to say some final words before we call it a day. Thanks, Jim. And again, I want to thank everybody who was on the, on the webinar today. Um, it, it was for you, uh, the lawmakers. And, and so I, want, I just can't say how appreciative of, of, of what you guys are doing in these 50 states and in this terribly challenging time. Um, you guys are, are responsible for the, the life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness for the folks in your states. And so what you guys do matters. And uh, that's, that's kind of what we're here for is to, to be that, um, that aid to you with doing what you're doing. Um, I want to say thanks again to Jim and Keeley in the comms department. I want to say thanks to Tim and Samantha and Christina on my team in GR. And again, if you have any questions, if I didn't get to a, to something that you thought we needed to discuss, or you have questions or want clarification, please don't hesitate for one minute to reach out to us at any point. Okay, well, thanks again to everyone for joining us, and we'll see you on this next time. Bye-bye.